When I got to Cuba, there was like, there was no street life, virtually no, no commerce, the sounds of commerce that you would, would have in a, you know, in a normal uh, capital, Mexico City or Bangkok or New York. Um, there, were, there, was no, there was none of that, and it was just sort of, at, at night it was, it was dead. There was no, you know, except in the very small tourist enclaves, there's just nothing going on. By the time I left, um, you know, there, was, there were hundreds of thousands of people who took up the call to start their own businesses. Most of them really small, you know, like a little pizzeria um, or uh, somebody who would, you know, uh, do some basic services. So it was, it was all very, very minimal, but, but in the context of Cuba, um, it, 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 was, it was a big deal. Um, and, and slowly towards the end of that, some people started to actually, you know, start large businesses um, that took advantage of money coming in from tourists. So, so it really was a, a transformation um, economically. Um, and I think politically, uh, obviously not as much uh, changed, uh, but, but there were some gestures uh, that Raul made that uh, I think, you know, it's questionable whether his brother would have done. And most notably, he, he freed about 70-something um, dissidents who had been jailed by Fidel. Um, and the, the, the fact that they were in jail was a source of great tension with, with Europe um, and with the United States. What he started to do in 2009 was to slowly open the economy uh, to some form of private enterprise. I believe it was early 2010, he began to um, allow people to go into private business, uh, open restaurants, uh, very small businesses. There were something like, you know, 200 or so different things you could do, some of them kind of funny, like button maker. Um, but so it was a limited opening. And Cubans had seen this before under, under Fidel, only to have it rolled back uh, quite, quite dramatically. And so it took a while for people to believe it. You can't separate what was going on in Cuba from what was going on in the United States. So um, Barack Obama had taken over as president in January of 2009. I got to Cuba in August. Um, and Obama represented a real, I think, challenge to the, to the Cuban government because he was somebody who was immensely popular and very difficult to vilify. Cuba had done a very good job of, of sort of portraying America as an unjust place, an unfair place, particularly for minorities. And here was this young African-American president who, you know, was also more charismatic than, than certainly than Fidel in, in, his, in his elder years. Um, and so they, they weren't sure what to do about that. And, you know, conveniently or not, um, what scuppered better relations was uh, the arrest, uh, just in the early days that I got there, of an American man, um, Alan Gross, who um, was there on a, on a USAID mission, um, an outreach, outreach mission, but the Cubans accused him of spying. Um, and his arrest, as far as publicly we were concerned, basically meant uh, that, the, uh, that, that the Cubans and the Americans, where, where everyone thought one of the first things Obama might do is try to improve relations with Cuba, that just didn't seem to be happening. And what we didn't realize, of course, is behind the scenes, uh, the Americans and the Cubans were talking. Uh, and, and ultimately, after I left, there was this very dram dramatic day where some Cuban uh, spies were released, Alan Gross was released, and the two governments uh, announced uh, the beginning of what was the rapprochement um, that, that took hold um, before Donald Trump's election. <laughs>